Closed captioning provided by Beaufort County. Well, welcome to Coastline. I am so excited that you're joining us today because we have a spectacular program. In just a minute, we're going to go out to Fort Fremont out on St. Helena Island, and uh, we're going to be talking to first uh, Stephanie Nadjid, who is the passive park manager for Beaufort County. Scott Grooms is going to be talking to her. And then we're going to come back here and we're going to be talking to Ray Rawlings, who is on the board of the Friends of Fort Fremont, to uh, discuss some of the great things that are taking place out there and uh, the Interpretive Historical Center that's going to be opening. So I am just so glad. Take it away, Scott. <music> Thanks, Rick, and we are here at Fort Fremont. A beautiful day and the rains have finally stopped and I'm here with Stephanie Nadget, and we're going to talk about the Fort Fremont project and what a beautiful project you have out here. Thank you, appreciate it. So tell us a little bit, a little history of the project and then we'll get into what's being done. Um, so the property itself was purchased in several different um, acquisitions between 2010 and 2014 and uh, the county was able to purchase all of what is called Battery Fornance and Battery Jessup, which you see here behind me. Um, in around 2015, plans were created to construct the interpretive center um, that is behind you, and we actually were just able to finish that this year. So what, um, what, what, what's gonna be the use of the interpretive center? The Interpretive Center, which we're um, hoping uh, will soon be named the Fort Fremont History Center, um, does have the diorama of the fort that the Friends of Fort Fremont built, and uh, that's in the inside in the main lobby. And then there's a small conference room that's going to be similar to what we have at Crystal Lake Park on Ladies mm -hmm. Island, probably hold about 20 people that is going to be available for rental. And then we'll also have um, male and female restrooms available to the public. And those will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. Um, although the History Center, the, the lobby of the History Center itself is only going to be open um, a couple of days a week when the friends are here to man it and provide docent tours and um, some information about the history of the site. Okay, a passive park. What, what really is a passive park for those who don't know? So a passive park is a park that is um, dedicated to passive recreation, which includes the enjoyment of one's natural resources. So it's usually very low impact, um, uh, mainly interpretation of the culture or the natural history of the site, um, hiking trails, biking trails. They can be paved like we have here um, that make it ADA accessible to get around the fort or they could be unpaved. Um, some of the other properties that I manage have um, wide, just flat earthen trails, um, but multi-purpose trails for, for hiking and biking um, that allow people to get out and just really appreciate the natural beauty in the area. So if you came out to Fort Fremont, the hours are daytime hours only, 24 hours a day. What, what are the hours for Fort Fremont? All the passive parks actually are open to the public um, every day, dawn to dusk. So um, no, the properties aren't um, closed for any holidays or anything like that. Um, we do have pedestrian access, um, particularly at this site, there's a pedestrian gate, um, there's a parking lot. So most of the properties will have parking areas um, with a gate that does or doesn't close sometimes at, um, close and open at dawn and dusk. Um, but the history center itself is going to have specific hours that the friends and I are working on um, when those will be. Now it's been quite a number of years since I've been out here. So what were some of the things that were actually done? I noticed a lot of changes coming in. Yes, so we um, have been able to, since uh, I've been hired on 20, in 2018, been able to improve the parking lot so that the drive-in and the parking access is um, much nicer, much easier, ADA accessible as well. Uh, we have the um, concrete sidewalks to um, get people around the fort so that they can um, see the fort and read the interpretive signs that we're going to put up soon. Uh, we also have a picnic pavilion that is quite large and um, pretty, 
pretty well sized for a large family gathering um, to have some family reunions or social gatherings. Uh, we will also be um, installing picnic tables in, in that as well. And then of course the history center behind you. Um, and then we just improved just some other small aspects of the park with signage, trash cans, um, that kind of stuff. So when you come out to Fort Fremont, you do, you see the, the two sections of the fort. There's a beach area that, is sim uh, that has a great view, I think of Paris Island, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And then um, the history center and, and of course the sidewalks. What are some of the things um, that there's in the future, not specifically for Fort Fremont, but in the, in the passive parks in your world? Yeah, so some of the projects we have coming up in, in um, conceptual plan right now are um, a nature preserve in, um, on Ladies Island called Pine View. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a park down in the All Joy community of Bluffton called Bailey Memorial Park. Um, so we're hoping to continue planning and then um, constructing some passive recreation and, and hiking and biking trails there. Um, we also have uh, a piece of property on Hilton Head Island called Ford Shell Ring and um, working with the town of Hilton Head staff right now and developing that uh, conceptual plan for that as well. Excellent. So how can um, folks find out more about Fort Fremont, about any of the passive parks? So I have a website on our Beaufort County um, website. It's called, uh, if you go to, um, was it BeaufortCountySC.gov? It is. Then uh, you can search in the search box Passive Parks Program and it'll pull you right up to my, my web page on our, our main site. Speaking of inquiring about the parks, I know like I think it's Widgeon Point has a, um, a wedding pavilion or a barn there. Now mm -hmm. as far as renting these, is, do they contact you or how, how somebody go about signing up to rent one of these facilities or use one of these facilities? Yes, on my website there is a Passive Parks Rental Facility uh, application form and that ends up coming directly to me um, for review and approval and then um, I can also arrange to schedule tours with somebody so that they can go and see the barn or look at the conference rooms and try and see um, if it's going to suit that person's needs. Um, I can also be reached directly um, at uh, my main office line, 843-255-2152. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Have we covered everything? Yes, I think that's it. All Thank right. You. Well, Stephanie Nagent with uh, Passive Parks, Beaufort County. Thanks for joining us today. Well, we're back on Coastline, and I'm excited to talk about our next subject, which is Fort Fremont. I'm joined by uh, Ray, is it Ray or Roy? Ray. Ray Rawlings, and uh, Ray Rawlings is a uh, uh, civil engineer. He has his uh, doctorate and um, is now retired and enjoying being on the board of the Friends of Fort Fremont, and uh, it's good to have you in uh, uh, the studio and on the set today. And uh, I had an opportunity to watch a video this morning uh, that included you and your wife uh, talking about uh, all of the uh, history of Fort Fremont. And I just was particularly enraptured by what you guys had to say. Uh, first of all, welcome. And secondly, uh, before we get into some of that history, tell us uh, how you and your wife got interested in uh, Fort Fremont and some of the other passive parks around here. Well, my wife and I, she's originally from Georgia. I'm originally from South Carolina. When we retired, we moved back here closer to home. And we're both civil engineers uh, dealing with military airfields, a lot of concrete and that type of thing. Uh, when we came back here, we went and took the Master Naturalist course. And as part of our project at the end of the Master Naturalist call, uh, class, we got tagged to go help see what we could do with Fort Fremont with uh, the late Pete Richards. He was organizing about a half dozen of us to work on it. So we started off looking at it for nature trails and that type of thing, because a nice little piece of maritime forest out there and some nice beach. There was so much history there that kind of evolved into uh, 
looking, making the Friends of Fort Fremont that could then do something about maybe helping with uh, interpretation. There wasn't a lot known about it. Uh, a lot of the history was kind of lost. So one of the tasks that Marin and I both got tasked on was to dig up the history and put it together. And uh, we did a big exhibit at Verdeer House uh, trying to publicize some of this and got a real nice rep response out of the public. So it's kind of built from there. Mm -hmm. Um, we both work for the Corps of Engineers, so we have a military engineering background. Of course, the Corps originally built this, this particular facility. Right. So it seemed like that was part of the reason that you were tagged to be involved in that uh, project. Pete's a very wise man. He grabbed us real quick and stuck us in there, yes. Oh, great. Good. Good deal. And uh, I, you probably don't know this, but we actually, Coastline, did a program out at Fort Fremont back in 2013 or 2014. And back then, all it was was the... Um, beginning of a walking trail, uh, a parking lot that, you know, you could barely recognize it as a parking lot, and the old um, garrison where the guns uh, stood. Right. Uh, very little else. But now um, you close down for a couple of years and you are in the process of reopening and you've got a lot of things there. Tell us uh, what you've got. The county has invested back into uh, not just cleaning it up and keeping it well. We now have sidewalks out there, some landscaping. The uh, parking is now much improved. They also built a history center that will be opening here shortly. And in that, we uh, have a diorama we put together. So it's a scale model of the whole fort. What's in the, the passive park is just the, uh, the old gun batteries. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was much larger. They had barracks, they had mess halls, they had officers' quarters. It was a 110-man garrison. There, right? All of it built from wood, and so over so, time it just decayed. So the only thing left is, well, a lot of it was, was disassembled and taken down to Fort Scriven and reused. Uh, foundations are still out there, pipes are there, that type of thing. But only the concrete remains. Mm. Um, in the diorama, we uh, had two photographs of the, uh, the forts of the, uh, uh, from that era. And then we had the engineering records. We had all the drawings of all the buildings. And we also had photographs of every building. So it's a uh, two-scale, excruciatingly accurate recreation of the fort. And I don't know of anything else for a fort of this era. This is what the fort looked like in 1905. It's amazing. I mean, you've managed to find a miniaturist to build this. And yes. you've got a bakery, a restaurant, a hospital, a, a water tower. Stable, fire control, the batteries, the guns, everything. Amazing. Uh, Dennis Kennedy is a, a museum quality uh, craftsman. And he did that essentially for cost. Mm. Uh, we raised money from the public. Uh, by having a, a auction to auction off uh, the different buildings on there. And you, one night we got everybody together around town that wanted to, and it got to be a real bidding mayhem in there. We sold everything and raised all the money we needed. Yeah, I was really disappointed. I looked on there and I thought, <laughs> I wouldn't mind paying $150 for that bakery. And <laughs> you tell went, me it's it all done. It in two hours. Wow, it that's was amazing. terrific. Well, there's a lot of history out there, as you've come to find out, I'm sure. And um, do you want to share with our viewers uh, or, or do you want me to sure, recount sure. what no, I read? <laughs> I, I, I'd be glad to. Um, there's kind of several themes we try to, be, to bring out about the fort. I mean, one is a, a very local theme is we have this wonderful harbor here. And it has attracted interest from maritime power since 1562 when the French first came, Charles Fort, and then the Spanish, and then the English built forts here. Then we had a fort here for War of 1812, of course, the Civil War. Then at the close of the 19th century, Robert Smalls had got a, a coal yard here, which was crucial for the new modern Navy, and put in a, um, a dry dock. And this was the only dry dock south of Norfolk that was big enough to take the new battleships and armored cruisers that the U.S. Navy was just starting to build. Um, and, and the port here was so unique. From what I understand, it's the deepest port south of New York City, right. 30 feet deep. And Larry Rowland, who's a local historian, uh, says that the um, geology and geography of this port is unique in that um, over 500 years have passed and it has not changed one iota. Right, because of the way the water and silt comes in and the way the tides are, it stays fleshed out and we don't collect a lot of silt in here. So we don't. Have, it doesn't have to be dredged like you do at Charleston or Savannah and places like that. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, a magnificent harbor and it's very large. Uh, the U.S. Navy used to do their southern fleet maneuvers. They'd all gather here and it would be full of ships uh, during that period. During the Civil War, it's full of ships. I mean, it can hold a lot of ships. So that Fort Fremont kind of met is the end of 350 years of fort building here in, in, in this area. And uh, it's all around that Port Royal. And the gunnery stations that were put there were actually part of a $50 million 
Endicott plan, right? Right. In 18, in weapon technology changed so much at the last part of the 19th century uh, because of steel and the ability to uh, machine steel and ability to improve the chemistry of, of, the, of the powders that were used. The weapons now can fire very accurately, much, much further, use bigger shells. One military historian says that during this period was the greatest change in military technology of artillery between the invention of gunpowder and the invention of the automatic weapon was occurring in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. and with that came the threat now of battleships, armored battleships made out of steel with these really big guns. And all of our defenses have pretty much been allowed to deteriorate after the Civil War. Nothing much was done. There was a little program in the 1870s. Uh, the technology was changing and we were essentially unpre unprepared. So there was a big uh, board uh, under Secretary of War, Endicott, and they had came up with a recommendation to build forts all down the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Gulf to protect critical uh, facilities. And they would end up putting in about 300 heavy guns, uh, mines, and 500 rapid-fire guns uh, all around the coast. So by 1910, we were as well protected as any country in the world. And that all evolves us. And, and this is just a one little piece of that big Endicott. Um, it got triggered because of the Spanish-American War. We were not on the original list. We didn't have a big commercial harbor. We had a shipyard, and all of a sudden, when the main got sunk, all of a sudden, this was where our, any damaged ships were going to have to come back to be repaired. So within just a few weeks, orders came out to build an Endicott Air Fort here to defend it. Mm -hmm. Now, during the Spanish-American War, all we had here were the mines that they actually put in the, in the river. We had some temporary batteries at Fort Fremont on Hilton Head and at uh, Paris Island. They would eventually get battery Jessup ready to go, but it would be 1899 before the big guns got in. Mm -hmm. Then they would be operational until 1911 when it got closed. And you had three 10-inch uh, big guns. These were unusual in the fact that the second they would fire, they would then come down and get hidden, right? Right. They, uh, they are a clever, a very clever use of physics. If you think about the gun starting up, up high, when it fires, it's got all that recoil that it has to do... So it goes down, now it goes down behind the parapet, it's pulled down behind the parapet, it's got 20 feet of concrete and sand in front of that to protect it. Mm -hmm. Now it's down low, the guys can reload it, <clears throat> you can change the bearing, the elevation, anything you have to do. But at the same time when it was coming down, it was lifting up a huge lead weight that's underneath the, the gun. Mm. So when it gets to its ready position, they lock that weight. When they're ready, they release the weight, it pops up, fires, and goes back down again. Mm -hmm. So it's only exposed for a very short time. <clears throat> that gun can fire an armor-piercing shell weighing 610 pounds, eight miles. It yeah. takes it across, halfway across Hilton Head. You actually have some film footage yes. on your video at the uh, at the website, the uh, FortFremont.org uh, website, and it, I, I could, it looked like there were four guys that were being used to actually put that shell in the breech of that cannon. At least it's, it depends on the size of the, of the shell, but it, it's to fire. That was a 17 man crew working around the gun. Yeah. Oh yeah. There were people all over the place. And they all, and they all have a job. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. <clears throat> they actually have a very specific assigned position and a task they have to do. Mm -hmm. And aside from the three 10 inch guns, uh, you also had two 4.77 uh, rapid fire. Uh, right. Um, munitions. There, there are three parts to, to our defense at Fort Fremont and this Endicott era. One is the big gun, and it was to fight the ship. It was to fire at the battleships, armored cruiser. It was going to take on the ships directly. They strung mines across the river that were electrically detonated, so they're controlled from the shore uh, to prevent anybody from crossing it. Well, if you put out a minefield, somebody's going to try to clear it. So the, they're 4.72 inch guns. Um, they would fire on the order of uh, six rounds a minute. They were to protect the minefield and keep it from being cleared. So it's an integrated system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the area that they were protecting were, was across the Port Royal Sound. Uh, it was the, um, uh, the the Port Royal Port that you talked about earlier, the dry dock and the, uh, the coal uh, refilling facility. And one of the things that I read, which was just kind of Sad. You talked about how the USS Maine was the catalyst for starting the Spanish-American War, but the Maine had been up here several times, uh, getting outfitted and getting coal and whatnot. And so the crew, over 350 men, uh, had come on shore and had made friends with uh, a lot of the local Beaufort 
per, uh, folks, right? Right. And so when the word got out that the U.S. Maine had sunk, um, and there is still some debate as to whether it was internal or external, whether it was an accident or whether it was the, Sp uh, the Spaniards that did it, um, uh, we were just um, beside ourselves because so many friends had been lost in that, uh, in that incident. Right. There's always been, this town always had, had a close tie to the military, just as we do now. The first commander of Fort Fremont, Knowlton, uh, he was a captain at the time. He actually married a local girl and went on to a very successful career in the Philippines, World War I, and retired as a general. Mm -hmm. So like, just like today, the military and the locals interact in, um, socially, not just professionally. So when, he, when anybody comes out to uh, Land's End and um, takes in uh, the Fort Fremont exhibit, um, are you going to be there to uh, kind of give, be a docent to give tours? We, right. We will have greeters there and periodically we'll have docents. We've been doing tours out there with docents. Um, and we will uh, be needing a lot more people in order to keep the uh, um, visitor center, the history center open and staffed. We have a very small group of people right now. But as when that actually opens, we're going to be looking for volunteers from the um, local area that would like to come out and be greeters. We will do all the training they need, and essentially, to help us keep it open for the public. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to need some manpower and some help out of the public to do that. But we'll have the History Center. They'll have displays inside. They'll have the video that you saw. We'll have the diorama, which will be, when that's open, that'll be available. We'll have signs that are going up, already made, that will be going up around the facility to uh, different places to show what was there. We have a tour buddy app that you can download on your phone. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll take you around and, and okay. they'll have information, give you connections. So we're trying to develop uh, an easy to use, multi uh, approach, multifaceted approach to, to how the visitor can interact. It's also just a beautiful area. They have a nice pavilion out there. It's a nice beach. Um, and a link to that app is found on your website, yes. Fort Fremont, and that's one E, F-R-E-M-O-N-T, right. um, named after General John Fremont. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortfremont.org. Uh, there's a QR code. You can pin, po point your uh, iPhone or Android device to it, and it'll uh, get you all squared away there. And then, um, you know, the, just in closing, I mean, nothing... The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I was kind of reading uh, a little bit more about this, and I was shocked that um, the, the facility, which had been so valuable and such an integral part of the Low Country, uh, ended up getting closed because of a politician by the name of uh, Senator uh, Ben Pitchfork uh, Tillman who uh, had already been governor of South Carolina, I guess, but he knew that the votes to keep him in office were gonna be up in the Charleston County area. So he ended up getting the Army Corps of Engineers to go ahead and move on up to Charleston, deepen the harbor there. I mean, we had a natural harbor here that was perfect for it and uh, ends up spending all sorts of money just for a few extra votes, right? That's the way it sounds, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just terrible. And uh, your interest had really mm -hmm. been uh, primarily the natural beauty of the, of the area, but have you come to really enjoy the, the history of this whole? Yes. Um, I, actually, I went to West Point, so I've got a, I've got a, a strong military background in, in, in that kind of thing. And as I got into the history of it, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, Larry Rowland and Steve Wise attend a lot of their lectures that kind of reintroduced me to my home state's history. Mm -hmm. So that they were a big influence on, on picking my interest right after when I moved back here. Um, so yes, I've very much enjoyed getting back into it. From the engineering side, it was made with natural cement, Rosenale cement. It's, it's a, a technology thing for engineers that's of interest. Mm -hmm. We've actually ended up going up to the National Park Service up in Charleston, talk, you know, working with them on some of the problems they were having with the concrete, because that's a lot of what we did in DOD. Right. Right. So it's, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, experience. Well, I tell you, it's exciting and it's so delightful that you were tagged to be on the on the board of the uh, Fort Fremont, uh, Friends of Fort Fremont. And uh, Roy Rawlings, I thank you for being on the coastline today and um, giving us some insight into what's going on out there. We look forward to the opening of the uh, Historical Center and uh, people can find out more by going to fortfremont.org, right? Yes, that's correct. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. All right, thank you.
That's today's Coastline. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll have another series of great guests next month, and we hope you'll join us again. The County Channel is also available on video on demand. Go to BeaufortCountySC.gov, scroll down to Public Meetings, click Watch Now, and then click the Video on Demand button and select your program from the list. Call the meeting to uh, order. If you'd like a DVD of this program, click on the link on the right and fill out the order form. And thank you for watching the County Channel. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see this movie. I hope it's better than the book. Yeah, I can't believe it's finally showing here. Yeah. It probably won't be as good as the book. You actually read the book? Well, no, <laughs> but I heard about it. Still, it probably won't be as good. Down in the June sun, I tried to shoot a thought, but the thought sunk. Nothing to do but scratch. Morning, Deputy Cook, the Beaver County Sheriff's Office. The reason I stopped you, you threw out a bag of garbage out of your window. You have a license, registration, and proof of insurance. Okay. What's the water roll down now? Day on, day on, day on, day on.